Hi, my name is Jason Rapert. I'm a state senator here in Arkansas, and I wanted to share with you a few thoughts as we get ready to celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day here in our country. You know, it was 1776 when our founding fathers came together, and they decided to form a new nation. And that new nation would be the first time that the people put into writing a declaration of their independence in such a way as we had. We now are the longest surviving republic in the history of the world. But it's something that we have to protect, and it's something that we have to ensure uh, is here for future generations. I wanted to visit with you just a moment and share with you a few thoughts about this. And I'm going to share with you some thoughts that are written about the Declaration of Independence in one of my favorite books. It's called The American Patriot's Bible. And I'm very grateful uh, for Dr. Lee for putting this together. In fact, if you get an opportunity, I encourage you to get a copy of this. This was put together. I'm pulling this up here maybe so you can see. Uh, it's Dr. Richard G. Lee. He's the general editor of the American Patriots Bible. And actually, Dr. Lee is in Georgia, and he is on the board of the National Association of Christian Lawmakers, which I'm very happy to be a part of. I want to share with you a few things about one of the insets in here about the Declaration of Independence. I think it would be beneficial for us all today to remember. On March the 23rd of 1775, when Patrick Henry spoke the now famous phrase, give me liberty or give me death to arouse the second Virginia convention to arms against the tyranny of Great Britain. He noted that we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm, which is now coming upon us. During the critical years of 1765 until 1776, the American colonies had been forced to endure taxation without representation, searches and seizures without probable cause, the confiscation of firearms, and on and on and on. Though the colonial leaders had tried to remain loyal to the crown and reconcile their differences, they were finally compelled to break away in revolt. The Declaration of Independence was then written as a proclamation to the world of their reasons for separating from England. But while the Declaration gives a detailed list of legal offenses that England had left unresolved, the founders saw these as more than isolated wrongs. Rather, they saw them as a part of a predetermined plan to take away their religious liberties and reestablish the Church of England to rule over their hearts and souls, thus enslaving the colonies. In that light, one understands the power of Patrick Henry's fiery words. Faced with such prospects, the Declaration stated that the American colonists were set to defend the laws of nature and of nature's God words that define the principle upon when the, which the founders stood. The laws of nature were understood to mean the will of God for man as revealed to man's reason. However, because man has fallen and his reason does not always comprehend this law, God gave his law in the Bible to make it absolutely clear. Thus it was that churches became the primary source that stirred the fires of liberty telling the colonists that the English government was usurping their God-given rights and the king and parliament were violating the laws of God. The founding fathers were convinced that it was their sacred duty to start a revolution to uphold the law of God against the unjust and oppressive laws of men. And the fight for political liberty was seen as a sacred cause because civil liberty was an inalienable right according to God's natural law. New England ministers in particular were decisive in rallying the popular moral support for war against England. They pressed their congregations to overthrow King George because they believed that rebellion to tyrants was obedience to God. From many pulpits, ministers recruited troops and strengthened them in battle with patriotic sermons. Listen to that, preachers. You're doing the people of this country a disservice when you do not rally them to the cause of this nation, a nation that was fought for so that we could have God-given rights enshrined in our U.S. Constitution. 
While the church leaders were well-schooled in the fact that the Bible placed great emphasis on due submission to civil authorities in Romans 13, they noted there are also many passages that approve resistance to ungodly authority. For instance, when the apostles were commanded by the Sanhedrin to cease preaching that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, Peter boldly asserted, we ought to obey God rather than men. So when you're living under ungodly rulers that make ungodly decisions and pass ungodly laws, a Christian would rather obey God than to obey man. That's what our founding fathers did. Therefore, it is no coincidence that one of the watchwords of the American Revolution was this, no king but King Jesus. That's what your founding fathers and their families and their supporters were shouting when we founded this nation, no king but King Jesus. For most of the patriots, their faith gave them the courage to stand on God's word and risk their lives and properties to break the tyranny of an unjust human authority. In their Christian worldview, obedience to God took precedence over country or government and their primary allegiance was to the Lord Jesus Christ. Indicative of this spirit, in 1775, the Lutheran pastor, John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, preached a sermon on Ecclesiastes 3.1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Concluding the message, he declared, in the language of the Holy Writ, there's a time for all things. There's a time to preach and a time to fight, and now is the time to fight. He then threw off his clerical robes to reveal the uniform of a revolutionary army officer. And that afternoon, at the head of 300 men, he marched off to join General Washington's troops and became colonel of the 8th Virginia Regiment. Ministers turned the colonial resistance into a righteous cause and served at every level in the conflict. From military chaplains to members of state legislatures, thank you, to taking up arms and leading troops into the battle. And ultimately, after two main British armies were captured by the Continental Army at Saratoga in 1777 and Yorktown in 1781, the other words of Patrick Henry to his fellow Virginians proved true when he said this, three millions, and he used that word, three millions of people armed with the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Three millions of people armed with a holy cause of liberty in such a country as that which we possess, one nation under God, are invincible to any force that would come against us. Friends, the Declaration of Independence is the founding document of the United States of America. Every single right that we enjoy today, our right to own our own homes, private property, your right to work wherever you would like to work, that you can get a job, your right to open a business. There is no one in America today that cannot decide, I'm going to start a business tomorrow. And you go about the, the process of putting that business in place. You can start a business doing anything in this country. That's not the case in many parts of the world. But think about it. 1776. People just like you and me that were fed up with ungodly leaders making ungodly decisions that were causing turmoil for their families. They decided they had had enough. And they decided that they were going to put their hands. They tried to negotiate. They tried to ask for help. They tried to ask for compromise, but they couldn't get it. And so they rebelled. And they formed this new nation. And here's a key factor for you. Those famous words, we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, of which include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see, just like what I read to you, the founding fathers had to have a reason and a basis and a rationale by which they could legitimately tell the crown of England 
that they are no longer going to be his subjects because he was doing things that were contrary to the word of God and contrary to what God had given to them. And so in the founding document, the very first founding document, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Bill of Rights are the three critical founding documents for the United States of America. You do know that the U.S. Constitution was not the original document that was guiding this country. It was first the Articles of Confederation. So the Declaration of Independence was the first. Then they had the Articles of Confederation for a season. And then they decided to do a constitution because the articles were not working out so well for them. But never anywhere did you see them reject the Declaration of Independence. Never any place. The Declaration of Independence called upon God four different times in very clear terms in this way. They called God, and even capitalizing that, go read the Declaration, they capitalized it to say, the, our Creator, number one, the Supreme Judge of the World, number two, Nature's God, number three, and Divine Providence, number four. And this was the essence. God has given us rights that King George didn't give us, that a parliament didn't give us, and couldn't take away from us, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so that's why I'm talking to you today, and I wanted to point out this, this message. If liberals and leftists in the United States of America are successful and pushing God out of the conversation completely in the nation, pushing God out of the picture and leaving no place in public discourse and unfortunately deceiving you to think that God has no place in this country, if they're successful at that, they will have pulled the entire thread out of the fabric of American life that holds all of us together. Because you see, if... God is not the author of these rights. Then your rights are only defined by a governmental body or a king or a despot, a governor with an executive order, a president with an executive order that betrays the entirety of the law of the country. Think about it. Think about it. Our country became what it is because it was founded upon the notion we have God-given rights. I have been a vocal supporter and, yes, a fighter for what is right in this country and for conservatism. And I'm going to fight and continue to fight and uphold the values that you've come to know me for. It is critical that we stand up for God and country in this nation, north, south, east, and west. There are pockets of people in this nation who have been convinced that God is not important. Morality is not important. Spirituality is not important. <clears throat> These are the people that you've seen rioting. These are the people that you've seen burning down buildings in our country. These are the people that you've seen assaulting uh, Catholic believers <clears throat> in St. Louis, Missouri. These are the people that refuse to honor private property rights, bust down gates and march in on the couple in St. Louis who then ran out to defend themselves, which is a right, a Second Amendment right in this country. This is an important Independence Day. So as you celebrate the 4th of July with fireworks, with family gatherings, whatever it is you do to enjoy your time. Take time to read the Declaration of Independence. Take time to consider my words that I've spoken here. And remember this. Our forefathers declared their independence from England, but in so doing, they declared their dependence upon God. God bless you. God bless my state of Arkansas. And God bless the United States of America. Have a wonderful Independence Day.